Hey. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I assume, you know, if you're still taking communion, please feel free to still meditate or if you just need a minute, that's okay. I'll just be talking about your background. Um, <laughs> but it's an incredible time together so far. Um, it probably changed it to the um, My name is Virginia, and my husband and I are ministers here at PCC. We've been in the last three years, which is really fun. Um, here's my family. So that is my husband, Brian, if you don't know him, and uh, that's our kindergarten daughter, um, Avery, she's five, and tomorrow, our twins, Hudson and Parker, will be 15 months, what? which is a uh, wild ride. It has been a, a wild year. They are walking and trying to talk, and it's, it's lively in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is our Christmas picture, which is really cute, but um, if you know us, we look a little bit more like this on a normal basis. Um, like to feel like this picture is kind of there, so no stops or ends or what's exactly going on, but it's, um, it's really fun. Um, a little bit about me, if you don't know me, I am a context person to my core. Um, I'm extremely curious and a verbal processor, which I'm going to try to bring that in today. Um, and if you're a Myers-Briggs girly, I'm an ENFP. Here. And um, I'm an Enneagram 2 week 3, again, if that means something to you. Um, and if you know me well, you know that essentially my entire personality can kind of be made up of Taylor Swift lyrics. I'm a hard person, really, so you can judge me now, but I'm going to be okay. It's, it's great. Um, and like I said, I consider myself a highly relational people person. I feel like one of my greatest joys in life is relationships, and the ones that God brings us just make it all the more sweeter. And I Yes, I just love that we get to talk about that today. Um, and so our theme for our time together is all about writing together, right? And it's the relationships that we can find with women who are aiming to follow Jesus with one another. And whether Jesus is new to you, or you've been following Jesus for a really long time, or somewhere in between, I hope that today can help you reflect on your own relationships and listen for where God's calling you within them. Um, so you can be turning in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, um, and that's going to be our main text for today. I'm kind of going back to that quite a bit. But in the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing a letter to followers of Jesus in Ephesus. And the first half of this letter, which we're not going to talk about that much tonight, but the first three chapters, Paul describes what it looks like to have our identity in Christ. He says that we are redeemed. We have redemption in Christ. We're unfathomably loved. It's indescribable how loved we are in Christ. In Christ, we're adopted. In him, we're chosen. We're made alive. We're saved. And in Christ, collectively, we can be one. And I love that that's the foundation being able to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So after he establishes who we are in Christ, he then discusses what this identity means for how we act and how we relate to one another. <laughs> how it's meant to really translate into our lives. And so Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore I, prisoner of serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one grace over the future. And skip down to verse um, 14. It says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of your teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And right that's our theme scripture on verse 16. There is a lot to unpack here. So please continue your Bible study if this inspires tonight. Please dig deeper because there's no way we'd be able to talk about it all. But I love how this passage that we're reading builds upon our identity in Christ. Right? It's who we are put into action. We were called by God. So this is who, how we should treat each other, how we should be together. 
And basically, our identity in Christ is meant to hold meaning for the way we relate to one another. The scripture says, with humility, with gentleness, patience, every effort to be united with spirit. And this is inspiring and beautiful sounding, but it's a high calling. I don't know if I've ever been always patient or gentle or humble, no matter how hard I try, right? And even the language in the scripture that Paul uses, and probably some common sense, um, would imply that this would be difficult, right? It says make allowance for their faults. Make every effort to fight for you, to be bound together in peace. And I love that even further than that, so if we, if we treat each other that way, we don't give up on each other, we have this kind of connection, we can, we, um, we're able to be transformed, to be mature. It helps us mature in our faith. Mm-hmm. It helps us become stable, not rocked by everything that sounds good. Right. We're, not, we're able to be empowered to speak the truth and love to one another and be transformed, really, into a community in which each part is helping the others grow. And be full of love, which again, who doesn't want that? Um, and our relationships are meant to change our lives for the better and help us become more and more like Jesus. Amen. And I've seen this verse again in my life over and over again. And it, it made me emotional really thinking about just the immense amounts of grace that God has shown me through the incredible women He's allowed me to walk with at different times in my life. I've been so undeserving for the women in my family and the women in my life that have walked with me through really dark battles, or the ones that carried me when I couldn't get up, or the ones who kicked my butt but I didn't get up, you know, or the ones who who helped let me do the same for them, invited me to do that. And many of you are in this room, even now, only in your career, but I feel like many of you are here. But it also reminded me that some people I want to share with, um, two friends that I met actually when I was 17 years old, uh, that literally changed and continued to change my life forever, even 18 years later. And those, that is um, Jen and Carrie. Yeah. And um, Come on. Hi, uh, Jen's the shorty up there. And uh, she, we were signing a chair one year, and I just felt like it was right to put it on. And then the three of us have seen each other for a lot. None of them are here in Arizona. Um, we've collectively seen each other through a lot of different things, faith crises, Breakups, crushed dreams, healed dreams, miscarriages, unexplained and scary diagnoses, weddings, babies, too many moves, um, years of sickness, big fights, lots of drama, and of course, incredible mountaintop moments. We literally know everything about each other, and they both have helped me follow Jesus more than I could ever describe. And I want to share that with you not to brag or to make anyone feel insecure. If you don't have this relationship or whatever, but really to honor and lift up God. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And a handful of years ago, my again, the shorty up there, um, found that she had a really rare terminal genetic disorder. And she passed away last year. Yeah. Thanks. No, Virginia, no, okay. well, I'll probably not But um, and <laughs> and she impacted my life even then, as she was struggling the last few years of her life. Her motto was to choose joy. She had this huge sign in her room so she would never forget it. And amidst losing her memory, or her ability to drive, or walk, or have a job, or her vision of what life would be, right? She wanted to remember to choose joy because she, everything she was was wrapped up in who God was. And although this was devastating, it was so inspiring to watch her fight through this. And it called me higher in so many ways. And I couldn't speak up writing together without mentioning these two women who have just had an incredible mark on my life. And even though this loss has been really hard, I think it's helped me become all the more grateful for the women that I see live this out. Amen. And there's so many. When our identity is in God, ultimately, I think it helps us write together. Amen. And this is the kind of community that God wants us to be a part of and to be connected to. He wants us to be like this. But I think it's so different than what the cultural current is that we're all in. Right? right? Think about our world. Um, there are about 8 billion people on the planet. <laughs> there we go. Um, there are about 8 billion people on the planet. And with technology, we're more connected right. than we've ever been. You can easily have hundreds of thousands of connections or relationships through social networks on a daily basis. And you 
are connected to people that you'll probably never, ever be connected with otherwise, which is so cool. Um, but the flip side is that I think on the same trajectory, the amount of lonely people in the world is skyrocketing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And um, Sherry Turkle, in her book, Alone Together, which I admit, you know, it's very intense, but it writes, digital connections may offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. Our network's life allows us to hide from each other, even as we are tethered to each other. <laughs> Wow, you know, um, I think loneliness can come in many different forms. There's lots of ways that we can feel lonely, but I think the one that we can experience most, I think even as women following God in this kind of, you know, connection-saturated world, is being surrounded by everyone, but not known by anyone. Right. Right. And I think we can settle for a more shallow, just more shallow, more hidden versions of connection without the demands of true friendship, and community. Yeah. And statistically, it's harming us. Um, around 2017, the average life expectancy of Americans decreased for the first time since the 1960s. In the 60s, there was a flu epidemic that explained why that was happening for a couple years. In 2017, there wasn't like a specific illness, right? We didn't have the pandemic yet. But why this was going on, people were trying to figure it out. And sociologists found that the cause was. Um, when they what they call deaths of despair. Mm -hmm. um, younger suicides, drug overdoses, alcoholism. Basically preventable diseases of unhealth. And this was before the pandemic, right? And then, and then in 2023, the Surgeon General, which I'm sure you're all aware of, declared loneliness and isolation as an epidemic. Right? Loneliness was the connector for all this stuff. Um, another great quote, Mother Teresa said that loneliness is the leprosy the modern world. Wow. Um, it can be hard to want to reach out or like see that in other people, right? It says we're the, we are the most physically connected and yet spiritually isolated people yeah. in the world. And loneliness is the cultural current around us. And we too will drift toward loneliness right. unless we swim against it with all our might in the other direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just like at the beach. Um, but God has designed us not to be alone or to exist with this illusion of companionship. I don't, I don't. Right. But he wants to be a part of a spiritual family with deep relationships right. that ultimately see us and help us become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and these statistics are different things. I, I find it interesting because I, no one wants to be lonely. I don't think anyone's like, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> right? Right. Right. No, no one wants to be that. We feel sad. And yet it seems like everyone is on some level. Right. Even the conversation people hear feeling lonely. And, and maybe you can feel that as you're here today. Yeah. You know, you might feel as you're in this room with a couple hundred women and feel like no one really gets where you're coming from. Or where you're going from. You might feel misunderstood by some people in your life. And that might feel really painful. And you might make you feel more isolated. Uh, maybe you once felt like you had really deep relationships, but those people have moved, or you've moved, or it's changed, or it's ended, which is a whole other lesson for a whole other day. We can get there. But wherever you are today, I want you to know that God sees you, Amen. and he loves you, Amen. and he wants to be close to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great starting point, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I don't think only this happens because there's a shortage of people, either. <laughs> like, there's a million people on the planet. Um, but I think at the root of, as I was crossing, why are the reasons that I could feel lonely or, you know, as I research and talk about people, I think there's a root in an unwillingness to be seen. Mm -hmm. And I think that can come from a lot of different things, right? We're afraid of what others will see or do, or think of us if they really knew what I felt, or if they really knew what I did. We can be ashamed of those things. Maybe we can feel overlooked, like we're never chosen, we're not the cool girls, or whatever. We maybe we feel like we've tried and it just didn't work, and I don't want to try anymore. Or we don't want to look like we're trying too hard, because who wants to do that? Um, or we just feel like we're independent, and we just, I, I don't want to care about this. I don't, people really, I don't really want to have to get into what people see in me. <coughs> but God knows how dangerous loneliness can be. Right. He has such a different vision for us. Mm -hmm. He wants to give us these spiritually rich, Friendships that can speak life and love into our being right. and help us grow and mature rather than tear us apart and isolate us. Mm -hmm. But we have to be intentional. And so 
where do we start, what do we do, how do I get there, you know? Um, and I don't have all the answers, but as I prayed and processed and thought about what's meant a great deal to me in building relationships, three foundational concepts emerged that can help us be women who thrive together. And those three are vulnerability, honesty, and commitment. And so loneliness is, you know, rooted in not being seen. I think the first step in spiritual relationship is vulnerability, which is the willingness to be truly seen and known. Yeah. Opening ourselves up to others, opening ourselves up to hurt. Putting yourself out there is hard, right? And we're going to look at 1 John 1 in connection to this, you know, Ephesians passage. In 1 John 1 verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we will have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is a really powerful scripture, and one that I go back to often. Again, it starts off with reminding where our identity starts, right? It's in God, who is light. Mm -hmm. And then like Paul in Ephesians, John here, who's writing this, confirms our connection to God affects the way we relate to one another. Right. Did you catch that? It's like, who are we lying to? Right. If we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. Mm -hmm. Come on. We can't lie to God. He already knows we're living in spiritual darkness. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's not possible. But when we choose to live this hidden life where we hide who we are, we lie first, I think, to ourselves, right. and then to other people. And when we live in this way, it says, like the scripture says, we're not practicing the truth. But I love the promise that, that's followed up in verse 7. It says, if we're living in the life, we can expose and open ourselves up to be fully known. What's the promise? We'll have fellowship with each other. That's the first promise. I think it's so interesting that the first thing that we're reassured of if we want to live an unhidden life is friendship. And then he goes further and he says, then we can be cleansed from our sin, which is wonderful. Walking in the light both restores our relationship with God and to other people. Amen. And we wonder sometimes why we feel lonely, but I think when we're hidden, we don't realize this kind of disconnection that happens. It makes sense. Like, I don't know, it's just interesting. But we usually think the opposite, right? Like if someone really knows what I'm feeling, or if they really, you know, or when I'm questioning, or if they really knew what I did, they would hate me. They would reject me. Like they would want nothing to do with me. Our shame sets in. And our instinct becomes to hide. Which we may think will prevent us from experiencing potential rejection, which I get. But I think it also ends up preventing us from experiencing potential love and friendship. Yeah. We just can't selectively hide. Wow. <laughs> but if we're not fully known, it's hard. I don't know. So I've seen this in so many different ways in my life. As a minister, I've seen firsthand the power of someone choosing to be vulnerable and then changing the entire direction right. of their life. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also seen just the destruction that's caused when someone does the opposite. Mm -hmm. I always tell my kids, even when I was like, you know, rocking them to sleep, that babies like, Always tell me everything. You know, like I'm always like, I'm kind of a weirdo, but I'm just like, always tell me you can tell me anything. Yeah. And like, I will love you, and you're gonna be okay, like, you're gonna be okay. Yeah. You don't have to say it. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think I know firsthand for myself, even at times, how isolated I can feel when I'm hating. Right? Yeah. And when I was a junior in high school, I'd been following Jesus for a couple years, and I just started to feel really discouraged in my life. Um, I felt like a lot of my friends who were walking with me in that stopped wanting, stopped caring about Jesus, stopped caring about trying. And then a couple of deaths happened in my family, back to back, and it just furthered this pain that I was feeling. And it was a very emotional time for my family, and I didn't know what to do with that, um, except move on, keep going, just keep trucking, you know? And I started to question why, but I didn't say it yet. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know how to stop and be honest. And I was afraid of what that would mean. And these questions led me to start hiding different aspects of my life and becoming a person that was dictated by whoever I was around. Um, I was never the same person in any context, and I would never let them intersect. 
And I was exhausted. <laughs> I was discouraged, I was exhausted, and I just wanted to give up. I couldn't do it anymore. And I felt like following Jesus wasn't worth it. I needed to still seem Christian to some people in my life. Um, and so I just, you know, figured that out. Um, and then one weekend before my senior year, my parents um, sent me to this inspiring Christian conference for students that I pretended to want to go to um, once they signed me up. And as I went, of course, God did his thing, right? Like, as soon as I sat down, the first thing I heard, God was speaking directly to my soul and saying, you need to just come out of hiding. Don't be afraid. And even though I didn't know anyone there, I just met all these people a couple hours before, um, I was like, i got to do it today. Because if I don't, I'm not going to do it. And so I pulled together a few of these girls I just met, and I was like, hey, here's what's really been going on. I told them about all the things I've been doing and thinking and feeling. And I was so terrified. And of course, unlike I expected, I was met with so much love and encouragement. And they shared truths with me about God and about my sin, about things I was going through, and truth about how I had to go home and tell people that actually knew me the same things, right? And, and honestly, I did, and they helped me to do that. And it was such a huge turning point in my life that I remember going back and just feeling so free. And these people didn't even know me, I don't care, you know, but, but they helped me open up people in my life to work through things and move forward and feel not hidden. And what's crazy is you know who I met that weekend? It was Jenna Carey. I didn't even know them before. That was literally the time I met them. And I wasn't going to see them again for another year, which is kind of crazy. I think when I was willing to be fully seen, God met me there. And he knew that I needed these women to walk with me through life. I would have had no idea that these random strangers would become who they were to me for 18 years. We can't feel fully known unless, or can't feel fully loved unless we're fully known. Mm -hmm. And spiritual friendship is being fully known and loving you anyway. And we're able to be God like that. God is that way with us. And as we've already discussed, when we aren't fully known and we're lonely, there's a lot of destruction that can set in. And I want you to ask yourself, is there any part of you that you're keeping in the dark? Is there any part that you're afraid for others to see? Vulnerability takes great courage. And, but it is essential in our spiritual relationships. And what's crazy, the phenomenon about vulnerability is that what looks terrifying and scary to the one who's opening up looks like incredible bravery to the one that's listening. And if it doesn't, then you're talking to the wrong person who talk to somebody else. <laughs> um, but vulnerability breeds vulnerability. It really does. It's meant to do that. When our identity is in Christ, this is what happens. And I think that's why the scripture says living an unhidden life brings about friendship. Because this, and what I'm not saying is tell every single person your whole life, all your trauma and everything, because that's exhausting and no one should do that. <laughs> but it does mean that you should regularly practice confession and openness right. with consistency with people in your life that are going to help you follow Jesus. We need that. Please, I encourage you, no matter what you're going through, it's never too far gone to experience the fellowship and love that comes from walking in the light. And I pray that we all can find women to be vulnerable with and be women that others can be vulnerable with. And so if, um, if vulnerability means having the courage to speak the truth about yourself, then honesty means having the courage to speak the truth about someone else. And back to Ephesians 4, in verse 15, it says, We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. The foundation of speaking the truth is love. That's the basis. So that we can become more like Jesus. That's the goal. And I've heard, I've heard it said that true friendship finds you as you are, but it doesn't leave you there. And I love that. I love thinking about friendship that way. It's become way more common and widely accepted to see true friendship as accepting you as you are, no matter what, without judgment. And while there is something to be said for acceptance, I think that's true, and judgment is a sin, so there's, that's another thing. But I think this statement can imply, this feeling can imply that we don't ever need to grow or change. We never do anything wrong. And I want to warn us, because I think it's dangerous to see the honesty that we might need as judgment that we should avoid. Because those things aren't the same. Right. And sometimes there's a fine line, so you've got to be able to have your identity in Christ to figure that out. 
but they're not the same. Um, there's an author, Justin Whitmill, in his book, Made for People, read it, it's amazing, it's all about relationships. He says, the grace of Jesus is knowing me fully and loving me anyways, which is what a friend does. Mm. And the same love that accepts me as I am can also tell me to change. Because real love, true friendship is, is for my good, not my comfort. And again, if our identity, if Christ is our identity, verse 15 says that to grow and mature and become like Christ comes by speaking the truth in love. And truth isn't just the hard, challenging things about people, like, are you doing this wrong, or whatever. It's also the good and the beautiful and the inspiring. And I think this also, the scripture is saying to us that the way we communicate matters. Right. If you're not convinced of that, do a study of Proverbs and you'll see how the words that we share, that we say, or that we post even, can make or break not only our relationships with each other, but even our spirituality. Mm -hmm. Proverbs says the tongue has the power of life and death. So how we communicate matters. And two crucial habits of honesty and spiritual friendships that I, I want us to visit here just for a minute um, are rebuke and encouragement. I think sometimes we can get these wrong. <laughs> At least I can. Um, I love to think of encouragement as naming a good reality in someone that should be cultivated. Whereas rebuke, sorry word, um, is naming a dangerous reality that should be avoided. Both are needed, both require love, and I think both can be extremely unnatural um, for our relationships. Mm -hmm. It's far more natural to stay shallow, yep. shoot the breeze, yep. or to be silent. Be like, well, not a problem. Um, not my, I don't, I don't want to make you feel weird. However, I think when the habits of rebuke and encouragement are practiced and rooted in love, like the scripture says, they have the power to help build us up in the most beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. And so, when I think of the word rebuke, we're talking about rebuke for a second, um, I kind of have this visceral reaction um, I'm anxious, I'm sweating, I feel like I'm in trouble, I, I don't want to hurt someone, I just, I'm worried. And probably from what I've seen people do, or um, in the name of rebuking others, or what I think that can mean. I, I would avoid scriptures that talk about, you know, rebuking or confession, I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about that. But however, I think rebuke can be serious without being harsh. And sometimes we get that wrong. Yep. Um, I think maybe a danger in someone's life always assumes that you actually know and love that person. Mm -hmm. And there should be committed understanding, right? Naming a danger without committed understanding is dangerous in itself. Mm -hmm. Committed understanding looks like asking questions along the way. There's a willingness to help them just beyond just naming what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's never reactive or defensive. It's not loud, it's not cool. It offers help, and it's not self-promoting. And that's what rebuke really is. In Proverbs, again, it says, wounds inflicted by the correction of a friend prove she is faithful. So a willingness to speak truth to one another, or even wound each other, like the scripture is saying, proves that we're faithful. Because if the fear of being judgment usually keeps me from saying something, but if I see my friend in danger, or if I see something going on that I'm concerned about, and I don't ask a question, I don't say anything, Am I really a friend? Right. Am I really loving them? Again, with committed understanding, with love, it all has to come from that place. It doesn't mean it wouldn't be hard. Um, but maybe the danger can be intimidating, but if rooted in these things, it can be trusted. And there was a time where, in Orange County, um, this woman who was kind of mentoring me in a lot of ways, we met every week, and you know, I was going through a really rough time. And I was a process, I'm a verbal process, like I told you, and I had a lot to say about the situation. This person was hurting me, and I felt really disrespected, misunderstood. I just couldn't get over it. Like, I just was stuck. And so every week, I would come talk about it, and then she'd you know, show me some scripture, she'd encourage me. I felt so hurt, so validated, so loved. Um, and she also like, I think she do a Bible study on this. She really like gave her own convictions, too. She'd be like, okay, great. Yeah. So about the next week, the same thing would happen the next week. Probably three or four times later, I'm staring, another thing happened, and I'm just good to be tired, ready to like, yell at somebody, you know, I'm just upset. She's like, okay. She shares me in scripture, and she goes, hey, I just want to check you for Bible study yet on this for yourself. I'm like, no, I am not. Um, and she's like, now, again, I love you, you're not in trouble, this is not affecting me, but this is the third or fourth time I've asked you this, we still haven't 
done any study on their own about this. Mm. And she went on to name the danger of me just being controlled by my emotions and being and living in that space. I was so angry. I was honestly wow. so upset about the situation. But I wasn't allowing God's word to infiltrate my heart. Because when other people fed it to me, and that's dangerous, right? Yeah. And I'm so grateful for how she's helped me because that meant so much to me. Yeah. And then moving on to encouragement. Obviously, that was a rebuke in a very gentle way, but encouragement is a little bit more straightforward, right? We like, we like encouragement. We like receiving it most of the time. You know, and naming the good we see in someone. But I think sometimes the same fear that we have in hurting someone's feelings that causes us to not speak the danger or to rebuke or whatever, I think it manif- can manifest itself in not naming the good in other people either because we fear awkwardness. Mm-hmm. Thinking, oh, they already know, or oh, so many people are encouraging them. And whether or not that's true, they wouldn't know how the good you see in them unless you say it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we all can name and we know the power of hearing or not hearing encouragement from those closest to us. Mm-hmm. You know, encouragement means so much from a lot of different people, but the people who are closest to me, that means so that means way more in different ways, you know, no offense. But but I think that that is deeper. There's more. There. Yeah. And if we don't share it, who's going to you know, if we see it? Mm-hmm. And I think we're all looking for love, and when we speak truth into the good realities or qualities in someone's life, it sends them back out into the world with more love. And just like vulnerability frees us up to be an encouragement to other people. Do people feel this from you? And I want you to consider, as we wrap up honesty, just how might God be calling you to be more honest in your life? In which ways? You know, we're going to wrap this thing up today with commitment. That's the last one. We've been talking for a while. Um, But we live in a world of options and opinions and instant gratifications. And um, I need a new mop. There's 25,000 on Amazon. Each has 50,000 reviews that I must, you know, find to through. Um, And most of you here tomorrow. And it's real. It's really cool. I really love it. Um, But this also paralyzes me sometimes. Um, I cannot hold out until I'm convinced that I'm choosing the very best mock or book or right. podcast or whatever. I, I'm a little crazy. Um, and if I want to be convinced that if I spend my resources on something, I want to be the best. And I want to get the best out of it. I also want it now. <laughs> right? Right. Like, that's how I feel. I'm getting those places. But I think sometimes we can place this, those same expectations on friendships. I want the 10 year friendship without 10 years. All right. You know, I want the same closeness and connection with all of these different people, but I don't initiate. I don't want to get hurt. And I don't want to ask them for help. I want them just to know. Yep. I'm saying because I've been there. Um, I just want to keep my options open until I'm certain that putting myself out there, being vulnerable and honest, spending my resources will produce this life changing relationship. And we do that because we've been hurt. There's lots of reasons why we do that. There's no shame. But I just don't think we're going to get what we want. It's just not real friendship. Mm-hmm. We don't know what we're going to get from a relationship until we try. And that's scary, but it's worth it. Yeah. You know, when I um, first moved to Phoenix, I, again, I told you the people person, I severely, severely underestimated um, the ability to make friends in a new place in a pandemic. Go figure. I um, think I have other problems too. Um, I'm such a people person. I feel like I can emotionally connect with a rock. Like, I'll be okay. I'm just gonna be awesome, you know. But I've been in the same with church before for over like since I was 18 years old. So like, I literally knew everybody in the church, and I underestimated how vulnerable that would feel to have to get to know a whole group of people, right? Yeah. Even though I'm in the ministry, and that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Yeah. And I underestimated that. I kept finding myself feeling misunderstood or uninvited, or left out, overlooked, even though literally no one was trying to make me feel this way, and please don't take any guilt from what you're not saying, okay? No one's fault. I think I have really interesting expectations. <laughs> um, and I even poured myself, like, my all. I kind of want to be in most relationships, like, oh, I'm, sweet. I'm like, I'm ready to be your best friend, you know? Um, but I even poured my heart into a few relationships that just showed over time they weren't mutual. And, and that's okay. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It was just her. 
But I think ultimately I learned in a new way that building new relationships was just different without the history and the season of my life. Right. There were lots of trials and failures and lots of initiation fatigue. Um, but in not giving up, I think that God brought amazing people into my life and helped me build relationships and an incredible community here that I just couldn't live without. I feel like I could stand here and talk just as long as I've been talking about all individual women in this room that have meant so much to me, whether we spent a lot or a little time together. All of you are so meaningful. Um, and all different life stages have helped me through hardship, through encouragement, through just giving me light and strength in their life. Um, I just couldn't imagine my life without this church family. A spiritual community is built up of people consistently showing up and living out these scriptures together we have been talking about today. And some of these will result in these like epic, you know, life decades long friendships. And some will be more of a close relationship for a season. Or even just a friend that you get to hang out with every once in a while that points us to following Jesus. All of those kinds of relationships are needed and valuable and worth committing to. We all need all different kinds of relationships and women in community, but when we're doing it together, that's the power, right? And so consider again the language used in Ephesians 4. It's one of commitment, right? We talked about this earlier. Make allowance for our faults. Make every effort to be unified. Bind yourselves together in peace, growing to build up the one body of Christ. So we're called to be committed to one another, but only because of our commitment to Christ. And we have to remember that, for you've been called by God. And because of that commitment, we're called to not give up on each other either. Right. And when God is the root of why we choose to be vulnerable or honest or not give up, we end up maturing. We build each other up in love. We don't get tossed about by all these different teachings or, you know, content. And it's hard for us to stay committed when our friendship takes time. Time shows us a lot. And honestly, if we gave it enough time, we probably would find reasons why we shouldn't be friends with anybody. Um, so it's important not to give up when you first have, when you first see struggle or when it's not working yeah. the way you thought. Yeah. Goes without saying, there's obviously unhealthy dynamics that we do need to take space for at times. But I think sometimes we're too quick to count that mm-hmm. before trying to work things out, before having our identity being in Christ and not moving through right. whatever boundaries we may need. Because boundaries are good, but they're not meant to be weapons. And God will make it clear when and how you need them. It's just important. So what might deep spiritual relationships in your life require of you? And you may be hearing all of this as we close it out and be feeling overwhelmed because you're like, I don't have time to invest in new relationships. Or I feel discouraged because I've tried this and it doesn't work. I feel so alone. Or maybe that made you feel more alone. I'm really sorry that happens. <laughs> um, but I want to encourage you wherever you are today, I want you to remember God sees you, yep. he knows you, and he loves you. Yep. He wants to be your friend, and he wants to help you lean in with people and start somewhere, start small. Doing something is better than nothing. No relationship or person will be perfect, including you. Um, so choosing to live vulnerably and honestly with the people in your life can help deepen your relationships and even present opportunities for humans. The goal is not the relationship with itself, but to become more like Jesus. And either way, we can commit to these, if we can commit to these kind of relationships, it all helps us build up one another and fight together. So thanks so much for letting me share today. Thank you.